start with the last uh, speaker of this session is Federico Franceschini. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, the opportunity to speak today, I will, uh, okay, we'll talk about elliptic regularity and singularity, but I will stick with a very uh, concrete and rather uh, simple problem to, to explain the, the obstacle problem. And I will uh, just present the problem, speak about the result and, uh, and an open problem uh, or conjecture. Okay, so what's the obstacle problem? <clears throat> so basically, you look for a function, which should be non-negative in Rn. And uh, as soon as this function gets positive, its Laplacian becomes uh, some prescribed positive smooth function, which you should really think to be one for the moment. And uh, it, uh, it's given in general and, and uh, smooth. So basically, there's this function that as long as it detaches from zero, becomes sort of mean convex, but there's a catch. And the fundamental catch is that this function needs to be C1. So the way the, way the region where it's positive connects with the region where it's zero, it must, be a, it must be a C1 connection. So there is no angle, okay? So a rough sketch should be something like this, you see? And uh, in this problem, what you do, I mean, so a good existence, for example, you, you prescribe a boundary condition and you minimize a suitable energy and you can prove existence of solutions, okay? So you're, uh, you prescribe this boundary condition, you minimize a suitable energy, which is just the Dirichlet energy plus the positive part of you, weighted maybe with this uh, F. And the function will reach, possibly, conceivably, the zero, and then it will stick there for a while in a region, which is the contact set, the boundary of which, of which is called the free boundary. The free boundary is, this, uh, is the boundary of the region where you is positive. What's important is that you don't prescribe it, okay? You prescribe the boundary condition, so this boundary is free in this sense. It's not uh, easy to, to understand what this region is like given the boundary condition. Okay, so let's maybe, um, see a couple examples, just to get a sense. So, in these elliptic boundary value problems, you always want to play a bit with boundary conditions and see uh, which configuration is stable or unstable with respect to perturbations, right? So, for example, you can get this fat disk and you can lift the boundary condition until you get you shrink it to a point or an ellipsoid. These are two D examples, but in three D things get so way more messier. But what I will talk about is generally in M dimensions. And there's this other important solution, which you can see it uh, sticks to zero and then it lifts off with uh, Laplace on one, it's just one coordinate square. You can also <laughs> make it more bent, okay? At least if you allow yourself uh, an F, which is not identically one, but a perturbation. Then there is also this sort of more uh, bureaucratic solution, you know? It's just Laplace on one, it touches somewhere. So it actually solves Laplace equal one and it's non negative, but technically speaking, we need also these solutions, and uh, they have a free boundary, and it's fair to, to put them in, uh, to consider them as well, because they are rising one way or the other. And then, of course, you can uh, construct something not smooth. You can uh, glue two of them, you see, and then if you start lifting off the, free, the, the boundary datum here, you will be able eventually to, to make these two fronts touch at a point where you get a cast. And then, of course, here I don't have a picture, but if you, if you were to lift off a bit more, you could get this cast to split into something smooth and uh, cover out a little hole of positivity in the middle. Okay, so this is just to give you a feeling. What's the big question in general, in general terms, is the regularity or the structure of the free boundary. And uh, very, I mean, in images, a regular point should be something like this, a smooth region, a smooth hyper hypersurface on a side of which you use zero, on the other side you are positive, and there is this C1 connection. But conceivably, something, I mean, worse could happen. We could have uh, positivity and the zero regions clustering together in something much more complicated a priori. And you would like maybe to prove that this is often happens this, but sometimes can happen this, but this happens rarely or maybe for very um, unlucky boundary data. So this is the sort of things you, you have in mind. But of course, what you prove analytically is, is, uh, is something different. You prove a sort of Taylor expansion. And then I hope to recover the geometric information from this Taylor expansion. So the Taylor expansion is, is really a Taylor expansion. So you, you pick a free boundary point, you, you look at the length scale R, which is small compared to the, well, to the length scale of the problem, which is the size of the ball where you're working, okay? And then you, you try to, to prove that this solution looks like some uh, fixed and uh, family of model solutions that you know how to describe up to a certain order. Uh, let me write that typically here, you would work with polynomials if you were working with a linear equation, et cetera. But in these sort of non-linear non, uh, non problems, there might be 
more general objects than polynomials. And it's important to parameterize them, but in some sense, they have nothing wrong. As long as you can parameterize them with a fine number of parameters, up to even n, <coughs> they're sort of happy because typically these parameters carry the geometric information on the free boundary. So studying the map that sends the, the free boundary point to the model solution, its parameters, you can recover the geometric information and, uh, and get some, and, 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 and go back from here to here. Okay. So the, the prototype of this uh, kind of statement is a, uh, it was a, is a term by Caffarelli from the 70s, a breakthrough in the area. So you are, let's take F1 for the moment, but the statement is essentially the same, which proved that such an expansion it holds up to order two, which is the first non-trivial order. And it's by no means trivial already to say that you, as some sort of tangent object, which is unique and which has a, um, the correct rate of convergence, let's say. So what Caffarelli found out is that this QZ essentially can be only two things, huh? and they are separate and only one of the two items. Let's, let's see together. So either QZ is this uh, sort of ramp solution uh, uh, in, along some direction EZ, which carries the geometric information of where the tangent plane is, and these points will be called, let's, for definition, regular for the moment, or uh, QZ is just a quadratic polynomial, which is non-negative, and is Laplacian 1. So you should think that these points will be called singular, and you should think that in, in this situation, at the infinitesimal point with level, you don't see the obstacle. Your solution at the infinitesimal level is just solving a plus one and being non-negative. Well, here you still see the obstacle and a fat one and flat, both uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> at, at the infinitesimal level. Okay, so uh, what's the geometric uh, counterpart of these analytic statements is that the regular points are indeed regular in the sense that what I was showing before happens, oh, oh, sorry, we're in this setting on the left. So around the regular point, you only find other regular points locally arranged along a smooth hypersurface and on a side of which you vanish and uh, on the other side you use positive and uh, Laplace on one. Um, and this surface is in this infinity. In the, instead, the geometric information around singular points is a bit more tricky. So you have to further stratify them according to the nullity of this symmetric matrix that you get here. And if uh, the, the, the matrix has nullity k, you will be in the k singular stratum. And the kth singular stratum is contained in a C1 manifold of dimension k. This is what makes sense if you you know, think about. Um, let me stress that the contained in general for F infinity with infinity methods cannot be upgraded to equal to. You can have a counter type thing inside uh, a smooth manifold. And the manifold will be C1. You cannot improve here in this setting to C infinity easily. It's not a bootstrap uh, of any sort. Well, before it was uh, work with bootstrap. Okay, so what's the, there are a lot of results and things one can ask. Today I present something, uh, let's say, a bit short <laughs> to, to say, but kind of uh, reasonable, I think. So you have the free boundary now, which is an n minus one dimensional object. And I told you that you, you can split it into the regular, the top dimensional singular stratum, and then the lower dimensional stratum. Okay, to get a rough sense of what the free boundary is like, you could say, okay, at least these guys are packed in something lower dimensional. But what about the, the top n minus one dimensional uh, typical point? It's not only regular, there are also th these guys in the top dimension singular stratum, which one should, would like to understand a bit better. And so these are the three, three situations that we have to be able to, we would like to describe. So these two curves are exactly the same, but according to our definition, this would be made all of singular points in the top dimensional stratum, and these would be all regular points. But in some sense, we would like to, to say that they're kind of similar, I mean. On the other hand, this point here in this example is still in sigma n minus one, but I hope we would agree with me that intuitively this should be a bit more singular because there's truly a cusp. So what's the, the idea is that here morally I'm solving Laplace and equal one a lot, while here I see some sort of flatness at a certain order, some sort of context, okay? So this is the, the trying to make this intuition precise is what is behind this theorem, which I uh, obtained with uh, Victoria uh, Zaton uh, some years ago, building on the methods of uh, Figali Serra and Figali Serra Rosaton, which essentially says that indeed you can find an n minus one dimensional uh, uh, stratum, sigma regular. So, sorry, inside the top dimensional stratum, you can find a sort of a regular part in the singular set. So, this set, sigma regular, covers the most part of the uh, singular set in the sense that if you remove it, you get something which is lower dimensional. 
So you can pack it somehow here. This is the first property. The second property is that around these points, you are solving the equation of Laplacian equal one and not seeing the obstacle at all possible orders. So at, at infinity level. So for all z in the regular in this part and uh, for all integers, you have a tangent polynomial up to every order. And this polynomial is, an is a series uh, which solves uh, Laplacian equal one and is non negative. And further, this sigma regular part is you contain a C infinity upper surface. In the, at the geometric level, there is this little improvement from C1 to C infinity. But, um, okay. Okay, maybe a remark for uh, people a bit more in analysis. The proof, the, what's underlined, the proof in general is this, uh, this discovery that one can use the frequency function, which is uh, something that arises in the theory of minimal surfaces, to study this problem. And the connection is not maybe so clear at the beginning. But you have to study the frequency of the difference between your solution and the linearized and the tangent object. So between you and this tangent object. But what's, what's interesting is that a truncated version of the frequency is monotone at all orders. And this, I mean, this is not, uh, this is the non, very non trivial piece of information, let's say, in a nutshell. Uh, okay, so let's see. Uh, indeed, if one wants to sum up uh, the theorem, it will say that the free boundary has an n minus one dimensional part. Which is sort of regular, at least in the sense that I have a infinite expansion in the point with sense of all points. And then there is n minus two dimensional stuff where you actually know what's going on. So you know that if this expansion breaks at a certain point, uh, you, you can tell what is happening. And the uh, good intuition to have in mind is that something like this is happening. So there are just two fronts touching with an order of tangency, which maybe is uh, 27, 45, I don't know. So you need to, but, but it's fine, it's a fine number. So these are the typical points we can uh, find, find, I mean, we can pack in this regular part, and these are the typical ones that we have to, to discard, but at least are, uh, are more rare. Okay. So I, okay, I'm a bit early, but I guess nobody would complain. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, so in the, in the pictures and in the examples, uh, what I showed you, of course, it's computer generated, but um, you actually see that this, this equation is solved not only in the point where it says and the level of Taylor expansion, but in a little neighborhood around, okay? And uh, this is, so there is this very natural question, which is, uh, it is the case or not? And, and of course, in view of these counterexamples, I was telling you, if you allow yourself to work with infinity methods on a infinity right-hand side, I mean, this theorem here is for a general infinity positive F. Uh, there is no hope to, to upgrade this to a local sort of uh, statement. And uh, you can even simply take uh, uh, any, any contact set in the shadow here in uh, light blue, there is the contact set of U, which is super, super thin, more than any power. Okay, Our po this point would lie in, the, in this uh, set, but uh, there is no hope here to solve in a neighborhood of Laplace equal, uh, equal one. <laughs> but uh, there is hope, instead, if you assume uh, <clears throat> Uh, if, you assume, oh, sorry. if you assume uh, F to be identically one or, or real and analytic, and this would be something, uh, an interesting open question. If you, if you work in the, in the open, uh, in the analytic category, um, especially because of uh, the method, because you would be trying to prove a sort of unique continuation. So from the point that you solve point wise, uh, Laplace and equal U, and that the <laughs> contact set around this point is uh, thin more than any power, you would like to say, okay, then in a neighborhood, I do indeed solve uh, Laplacian equal U. And this would follow if one was able to apply this uh, frequency method directly to U minus uh, a suitable analytic answer. So this QZN, but let's say summing all the series. And so investigating this, uh, it, it's not so simple, but uh, uh, the Amgen's frequency function is a popular tool around here. So I hope that maybe uh, I find somebody to, to, to try to do this with. And okay, so this is really what uh, I wanted to say. But, Question. Do you assume any regularity for the boundary of the outdoor? That's right. Okay. I mean, you mean uh, here I was working in the ball, you know, and uh, the, all these theorems are, in, are interior theorems. So I just prescribe a smooth I mean, a boundary, and then I get C feet as, as soon as I enter the ball. And, uh, and then everything is staying away from the boundary of uh, DB1. I don't know. 
many results trying to see what happens when this set touches here the boundary. But but uh, there are uh, in a similar problem like the one phase or some problem of optimization of eigenvalues. So there are other free boundary problems where this question is more studied about how the free boundary meets the boundary of the set. But here I, I don't have a your intuition. Yeah. It's more of an integer. Oh, good sense. Yeah. Okay, coffee.